Uh, so I work for CIU, which is a company that does um, market research and consultancy focusing on the mining metals and fertilizers industry. So unsurprisingly, in the last two or three years, um, the, the, the transportation segment and electric vehicles in particular has become extremely important to a variety of the materials we cover, and probably none more so than uh, cobalt, nickel, and lithium. So today I'm going to do a sort of a, a fairly deep dive into the, the nickel segment, um, as well as also have a quick bit of coverage of lithium at the end. Now, the situation with nickel is quite interesting because it's both, electric vehicles are both less important to it than, than other commodities, but it's also quite interesting in sort of the, the, the medium to longer term dynamic of the, the breakdown within different nickel sub-segments um, as to how the demand from electric vehicles could be met. So what we're sort of showing here is that there's, there's been an overarching sort of view on the market that, that a lot of people have taken up in the last year or so, where we've seen that, so, so nickel is consumed, the battery segment is only maybe 5% um, of nickel demand at the moment, so it's, it's pretty insignificant for right now. But what the chart on the bottom right there shows is that it's growing at you know, almost 20% per year compared to maybe 3, 4, 5% growth in the other nickel end uses, um, of which stainless steel is the most important, accounting for about 70% of nickel demand. Now, at the same time, we're seeing that the, the new supply that we have seen and that we're expecting to continue to see is in the form of nickel pig iron or ferro uh, or ferro-nickel, so iron-nickel alloys, which are essentially only suitable for use in stainless steel. So we've got all the new supply coming in form that is uh, only suitable for stainless steel, but the demand segment that's growing most rapidly is in batteries where you can't use the new forms of those products. So um, what some people have sort of led to th that believes is that at some point, depending on how quick you believe batteries, battery demand would grow, is that we would need supply of uh, the kinds of materials that are more suitable for battery, uh, battery applications um, in terms of nickel. And there's two challenges there. Th th those would either come from um, sulfide ores, which there have been very limited discoveries of uh, over the past decade, two decades. Um, so that's very challenging uh, from that perspective. Or from the hydrometallurgical processing of laterite ores. There's plenty of that kind of ore around, but what we've seen in recent history is that the capital cost and the operating cost and the technical challenges around the hydrometallurgical processing of laterite ores has been extremely challenging. So in the face of a very challenging and high-priced uh, new supply environment, and demand for those sorts of products, people have said, well, okay, maybe we're, we're gonna see a huge disparity between nickel break into two markets, the uh, ferro-nickel and NPI use for, uh, for stainless, and then everything else for batteries and other applications. But I think, and hopefully in the course of the next few slides, I'll show that the situation might be a little bit more nuanced than that. Um, so I think one thing that's interesting, actually, the left-hand chart here shows, as you've seen plenty already, uh, a couple of forecasts of scenarios for EV, um, EV sales, global EV sales, um, under sort of a base case in a, a green scenario. Now, this is just battery electric vehicles. Um, and it's quite interesting because actually something that hasn't been mentioned in huge detail so far is the difference between the raw material requirements between a, a battery electric vehicle and, say, a plug-in hybrid or a, or a standard hybrid. And those, those are hugely different. But just for now, focusing on um, battery EVs, you can see in our base case, we're looking at maybe only five, six million units by 2025. And in a more aggressive scenario, maybe 13, 14 million units. And the impact on nickel sulfate, and nickel sulfate is the form of nickel that you need for batteries, demand relative to where we are in 2016, 2017, is, um, is hugely, it hugely varies depending on what you believe about EV uptake. So we've got the difference between the market growing four times for the demand for nickel sulfate or the demand growing almost six times um, between those base and green scenarios. And I think there are some people with more aggressive views as well so that they would, they, they would have demand growing yet further than that. And we have certainly seen a supply response um, already. We're, we're, we're seeing a um, significant amount of new sulfate capacity, often integrated into existing producers. So for example, uh, Jinchuan is a large nickel refiner in China. Um, and Norilsk in Russia, through their, their uh, Finland refinery, have added the, produ the, the capacity to, produ build, um, to produce sulfate at those facilities. Um, and BHP in Western Australia is also, is also in the process of adding sulfate. So, between those sorts of um, producers, we've seen a significant supply response. So based on known capacity expansions, we're seeing, we're expecting to see supply double, you know, 100% increase between 2017 and 2022. That's what the left-hand chart is showing. And showing you also that if you look at the breakdown of where that's based by country, it's China, it's Japan, it's South Korea, it's Taiwan. Um, so the, the significant majority of that is, is based in Asia, where the, the battery manufacturing obviously uh, is predominantly based as well. 
But when you set that against the two demand scenarios um, shown in the previous slide in the right-hand chart here, you can see that that, that um, capacity increase that we're expecting under the base case environment maybe covers us through to 2022 and before we start needing further capacity additions. But under this more aggressive green scenario, it barely covers us for a few years' time. So um, even though we're seeing a doubling of sulfate, nickel sulfate capacity, we are certainly going to need more. And the amount more we require um, depends very much on what you believe about EV uptake. And this sort of illustrates a wider response that makes things very challenging for, for the, the mining and metals environment in that when there's so much uncertainty on the supply side, having a, uh, a diligent and organized and reasonable response on the supply side is very difficult, especially when you're talking about huge capital investments and quite long lead times for these projects to come to fruition. Um, so just to, I'm not going to go through everything on this slide because it's quite dense, but basically you can, the, 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 where the nuance comes in, I think, on the, the sulfate side of the nickel market is that there are quite a few different routes uh, and pro ways to produce this product uh, technologically. And so I've sort of categorized those, and this isn't exhaustive, but you can roughly categorize those into five different types. Firstly, people who simply buy refined nickel, often in the form of powder, um, Add, add sulfuric acid to it, you've got nickel sulfate. The operating cost or the conversion cost of that process is relatively limit, is relatively small. The capex is low, but the problem is, is that you're buying nickel at, uh, you're buying a finished nickel product, so that input cost is going to be relatively expensive. And you're dependent in terms of your future growth is very much dependent on the, incre the continued availability of that high purity uh, of, of refined pure nickel. Um, now, what you've also had are the kind of the people I mentioned before where uh, sulfate capacity is being added to the traditional sulfide smelters. Um, so these guys are taking sulfide ore, smelting it in a furnace, and they've traditionally historically made that into a variety of nickel and uh, products. Usually this is pure refined nickel, but now some of those guys are also adding sulfate capacity, so they have the, 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 the possibility of turning some of that material that was uh, refined nickel going into stainless and other applications is now being pushed into the battery segment. But again, as I sort of mentioned early on, the new sulfide... The, the, no, uh, the last new sulfide smelter was Jinchuan in China, and that was, you know, we're talking 10, more than 10 or 20 years ago. So no substantial, there's very little new capacity expected on the kind of scale that we would be required to come from that end use. The third option is recycling, and we're certainly seeing more and more uh, investment in recycling capacity, but as Elsa sort of implied in her, her um, chart at the back, the lag, the, the lag to get the material back um, in order to get the nickel out of it, especially when we're moving, as opposed to cobalt, we're moving to more nickel-intensive batteries. So the, the pool of recycled EVs from, from, that, will, that will come to the market in 10 years' time will be less nickel-intensive than the requirement of a, a present-day EV at that point. Um, so that, that also presents a barrier to getting more nickel sulfate from these sorts of end uses. So it leaves us with two other options. And one is sort of the, the kind of uh, capacity that I referred to earlier, the hydrometallurgical processing of laterite ore. Plenty of laterite ore, um, so there's no fundamental problem on the reserve front, but what we've seen in the past is very high capital costs for these uh, sorts of operations. Um, and then one slightly more left field uh, option is the nickel pig iron producers that exist at the moment or that, that may come to the market I in the future, is that you can, by adding another converter furnace, you can turn your iron nickel alloy into a, a, a matte, sort of a, a mixed low grade matte product, which you can then co co convert into sulfate. But the conversion costs of doing so are relatively expensive. Now, um, and I think that the, so yeah, so in this chart I wanted to show, to give a bit more of an illustration of the, the variances in the costs of that hydro process to produce sulfate from a laterite ore. It's highly variable on your capex assumptions. The cobalt price, because most of these, as, as Elsa also mentioned, a lot of these uh, operations are nickel cobalt together. Nickel is the principal driver of the economics of the product, but in a new environment where we've got much higher cobalt prices, these projects, that, that's, that's a, that byproduct benefit is becoming more substantial. But in the left-hand chart here, this, this waterfall sort of shows how you build up to an incentive LME, and the LME is like the, the global benchmark nickel price, what that price needs to look like in order for one of these new projects to make sense. So firstly, you've got, you've got operating costs at these hydro plants around $10,000 a tonne. But when you factor in the capex on top of that, the kind of payback that you need increases the incentive price for, for one of these projects up to maybe more like $20,000 a tonne. Then when you deduct the byproduct credits and you also deduct the fact that nickel sulfate gets a substantial and growing premium over the LME price, then you end up with a more reasonable um, incentive price that's required to bring these kinds of sulfate projects to the market. 
uh, than has been assumed historically. Historically, people were thinking you would need a nickel price of 18 or $20,000 a ton plus. And over the last five years, the nickel price has been somewhere between 10 and $15,000 a ton. So none of these projects have looked very feasible in the past. But when you start to consider these other influences on the economics, they start to make a lot more sense. And we've seen that borne out because just in the last two or three months, uh, several new projects have been announced based in Indonesia that would, that would um, use this sort of process and would be targeted and focused on producing sulfate. The chart on the right-hand side shows how uh, just the variance in that incentive price based on uh, lower than has traditionally been seen uh, capital expenditure because some of these new projects that are announced have had a substantially lower capex per installed ton of capacity than we've seen in these hydro projects in, in recent history. And the extent to which that, that can actually, that, that may be reasonable uh, certainly remains to be seen. I think they're, they're taking the advantage of having an existing infrastructure in place, which will help. But even after taking that into account, the, the capex that they're talking about seems lower than lower than you might expect. So certainly need to take that with a pinch of salt. But if they are able to reduce the capital expenditure of these sorts of plants, then the incentive price and the feasibility of these projects starts to look a lot more reasonable. The other thing to think about is the sulfate premium has a large influence on uh, the viability of these sorts of projects, as well as the cobalt price, although that's harder to model. Um, but yeah, yeah again, the, 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 so that sort of the dark green and light green show that if there is no sulfate premium, um, then you need the LME nickel price to be more like $20,000 a ton. But if, it, if that sulfate premium continues to grow because of the tightness in the market, then again, these projects look more reasonable. So what it shows is there's a great deal of uncertainty on what needs to be going on in the wider nickel market. The, the battery segment doesn't really move the LME price at the moment because it's only 5% of the overall market. So it does make the economics around these projects quite challenging to respond to a rapidly growing segment that is still only a small proportion of the market. Um, oh, yeah. Sorry, I thought that's, that's all I have on nickel. Um, and we'll talk more about it in the panel, I'm sure. I want to try and just give a, a two-minute overview on the lithium market as well, and then we'll, we'll discuss that more in the, the Q&A as well. So the lithium environment, again, as sort of Elsa implied, we've, there's no great problem with the abundance of lithium material in the ground. Um, the lithium price grew very substantially through 2015 through to 2017 and through, and through uh, 2018 as well on the back of rapid demand growth uh, drew almost, almost entirely to EV uptake during that period of time. Um, and lith lithium demand is extremely sensitive to uh, the number of EVs that are out there. 70 to 80 percent of lithium demand growth is, is going to be down to EVs over the next five years um, and growing further in the future. But, where, but it is also it's less sensitive to the different types of batteries that are used, so the different cathode chemistries that are out there all use a relatively similar amount of lithium, so that, that it's less exposed on that front. Now, we've seen a big supply response in terms of new mine supply that's coming on stream last year, this year, next year. Um, but up until maybe the start of this year, there were bottlenecks in the supply chain. So the, the spodumene that comes out of the ground from the hard rock producers in Australia needs to be converted into lithium chemicals, which at the moment exclusively takes place in China. Um, the bottleneck in getting that material uh, through to the end uses, getting the, the new lithium carbonate from existing suppliers qualified by battery manufacturers and that sort of thing, has led to bottlenecks in the process that's enabled the lithium price to stay quite high up until the start of, say, 2018. But at the start of 2018, there are a few things, the largest of which is the SQM, which is the one of the large uh, brine-based producers in Chile, had the, their, the amount that they were allowed to produce had been limited by a quota set by the Chilean mining authorities. And that had been the case for some, year, some period of time. They eventually reached a, thanks in part to the new government that came into Chile at the end of last year, I think, a new agreement was reached that substantially increased the quota that SQM were allowed to produce. And um, I think at the same time, demand was marginally underperforming compared to some of the more bullish expectations. And some of the sentiment fell out of the market a little bit, which had been keeping spot prices in particular for lithium extremely high. So the spot price has fallen quite substantially, but uh, remains well above where, where it might have been two or three years ago. And I think broadly speaking, the chart on the, so the, chart on the bottom left is, shows that we are expecting that supply response to continue to, to appear. And we've got 275,000 tonnes of uh, lithium carbonate equivalent expected to come on stream from committed projects so these are either already under construction or they're well financed and we certainly expect them to happen in the next couple of years and that's 275,000 tonnes of new lithium capacity against a market that is only just higher than 200,000 tonnes at the moment 
So even though you're expe we're expecting maybe 15% annual growth in the market, we've got a huge supply response that we expect to be enough to be more than enough to keep us uh, to keep the market satisfied in the medium term. But I think there's an interesting dynamic, and it's the same case in in cobalt um, and certainly in nickel as well. Is that a lot of the forecasts, certainly in in my industry, it's very hard to look further ahead than four or five years time, especially when you're thinking about new projects, because the stuff that you just don't know what's going to happen um, that may be out there. And at the backdrop, a lot of, and on the other side of the equation, a lot of EV forecasts don't really show the market taking off until post 2025. So this, we're already needing substantial, um, and the, the EV market's already been extremely disruptive to certainly lithium, cobalt, and also nickel increasingly. Um, the resp and we've seen a one sort of one step of supply response, but the supply response that might be seen need to see again post 2025 is going to be a mag an order of magnitude greater. Um, and I think that's an interesting sort of dynamic that we need to be thinking about in the, in the longer term as well. Um, and I think those are all my slides for today, but uh, yeah, thanks very much.